Well, good morning, folks. Uh, welcome to this little tutorial with myself, Graham Booth, and uh, all the nice people at Search Press. I'm not going to talk too much um, just at the moment. But, well, I'm going to talk plenty, but I'm not going to talk too much because I'm staring at this camera and there's no one else around and it's all very strange, but we'll see what happens anyway. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the tutorial. I'm going to move the camera a little bit, bit down onto the paper and then I'll talk a little bit, bit about what I'm using and then we'll get started with the tutorial. So two seconds and I'll just do that. Okay, now hopefully everyone will see my paper and the paint box, water and my little sponge down here. And uh, that's essentially all I need. So before I begin, I, I just want to, uh, uh, I'm assuming everyone can hear okay, certainly, but let's hope so. Um, first of all, books. The, the book that this is from is the Watercolour Landscapes book. And uh, the project we'll be doing in this is this one, which is Springtime in the Park, which is a place uh, quite near to where I live here in Belfast. The, uh, there are lots of different projects in the book. And as they say, available from all good booksellers and direct from Search Press. And over in Search Press, over in Tunbridge Wells, we've got Monica today who is answering your questions. I'll try to answer as many as I notice, but um, we shall see. The other book that I've got, this is actually in French because I don't have the English version. And this is the, the one, uh, Street Scenes in 30 Minutes. And again, available from all the same places. And there's a new one coming out later in the year. And it's all about snow scenes. And it's the part of the Using Three Colours series of books. Okay, get started to this and then hopefully I can relax. It'll be much more relaxing painting than, uh, than not painting. So let's, uh, let's get started. First of all, the paints that I'm using are, if I hold them up for you, you'll be able to see. The, the ones that I'm using and that I generally use, I use two blues, two reds, and two yellows. And the eagle-eyed amongst you will see that there's a lot more than six paints there. But essentially, my, I have a cool blue, which is thalo blue green shade. I have a warm blue, which is ultramarine. I have a cool red, which is quinacridone magenta and a warm red which is cadmium red in this case and my yellows i've got a warm yellow which is cadmium yellow and a cool yellow which is windsor yellow now the actual paints don't really matter it's the warm and cool versions that matter the other little ones i've got i've got cobalt here cobalt blue i've got burnt <coughs> excuse me burnt sienna because i use quite a lot of burnt sienna <coughs> And down here I've got quinacridone gold, which is a lovely golden yellow. So I'll be uh, using most of those paints. Probably not, not them all, but most of them. Brushes today I'm going to be using... I like to use a sort of big flat brush for washes. So I'm going to be using that for my initial wash. The uh, Most of the painting will be painted with this brush, which is uh, size 14. It's a sable blend. Uh, and most of these brushes are made by Rosemary & Co. The paint is mostly Windsor Newton, but again, any good, any good paint will work fine. Uh, slightly smaller round brush and a smaller round brush again. I've got my little sword liner here that I'll use for the trees. And I have the, this is an old, old sable brush. It's about 50 years old. It's the same size as that one. So you'll see how worn it is. But I use that to soften edges, and it's a very important brush for me. So, let's get started then. The thing about watercolour is that it does require a certain amount of confidence. It, it requires you to, if I can put it this way, it, you need to paint as if you know what you're doing, even if you don't. That might sound a bit silly, but you must apply the paint with confidence, and that usually means plenty of water, certainly in the early stages, plenty of water and plenty of paint because that means the paint won't dry as quickly and if it doesn't dry as quickly you have got more time to play around with it. Now the way I'm doing this may not be exactly as it is in the book because every picture a painter paints is going to be done slightly different but it will be essentially the same. So I'm going to start off with a wash of cobalt blue. I'm going to use this for the sky, but I'm actually going to use a varied wash the whole way down the, the uh, paper. 
So plenty of paint, plenty of water, and make sure the brush is full. So that means like, like that, where it's almost dripping. Do not do this to your brush, because if you do that, you're essentially emptying the brush. So you want a good, full brush. And then, really, th this big flat brush means that I can cover, cover this quite quickly. And let's get some clouds in the sky. So for clouds, I just stop where I want the clouds. And then just go in with plain water. Now, that will give me a, a soft-edged cloud. So if I wanted a hard-edged cloud, you can use something like a little sponge, which I think I used in the book. I don't have one to hand, but we'll use a little tissue here. And the tissue will allow me to get a slightly harder edge. So if I want some of those nice cumulus clouds with the hard edges, I can use a little bit of tissue to do that. But the water must be put on first. Don't try and soften the edge without uh, the water being there too. And then we'll go back in. With, now you can see because everything's so wet, not, nothing is drying too quickly. Everything's flowing together quite nicely. We've got the building there. The building's a light color. So what I'm going to do is just use water in there as well. The whole point of this is that I'm trying to keep the wash continuous. So in other words, I don't want any breaks. I don't want any edges. When there are no edges, there is essentially nothing there. A little bit of quinacridone gold in the blue. And we'll bring this across and up like that. Oh, I've just realized I didn't say hello to my grandchildren who might be watching. So hello to Jack and Jess and Lucy. And there's quite a few of you out there watching. So thank you for, for making the time and trouble. And I know some of you have tuned in from America, which means getting up very early. So, so a particular thank you to, uh, well, Gary, anyway. Let's hope there's a few others. Uh, and then down in here, I'm going to start the idea of the daffodil. So we'll get some, get some cadmium yellow, which is a nice bright yellow. I'm just going to just streak that along. Now, this might look a, a little bit strange after all, where, where are all the petals and the stalks? But that all comes later. At the minute, we're just trying to just get a simple wet wash over all of the paper. So that's stage one, essentially. That's that first wash finished. Everything is wet, uh, and it'll take a couple of minutes to dry. So... What I'm going to do is dry, this will probably deafen you all, so I'm going to dry it with the, the uh, little hair dryer here and uh, then we can get on with the, the next stage. So I'll, I'll not, you probably won't be able to hear me if I talk, so I'll not bother. There we go. That's pretty, pretty dry now. Now, as I say, the, the, if you only remember one thing from this tutorial, it would be paint wet. Because if you paint wet, it makes life so much easier. You might think you've less control when you're painting wet, but in fact, letting watercolour do what it wants is part of the fun and the beauty of watercolour. So do try to uh, allow that to happen. Okay, next stage then, we've, we've got the... That's essentially the background. That's the first wash. You saw how simple it was. I didn't actually paint anything. I put colour in roughly where colour should be. I didn't really paint anything. But about half of what you're seeing there will actually still be there in the final painting. So with this first wash, you get about half of your painting painted for free, almost without making any big effort. But now we have to make a little bit of an effort. What I'm going to try to show here is the idea of indicating trees as they go into the distance. Now, the problem is what you need to do to, to get this effect is you have to make a difference between the close trees, the medium trees, and the very distant trees. And the way to do that is just simply paint them in, in different ways. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the distant trees, because they're in the distance, you expect them to be less detailed, less colorful. The slightly closer trees, you expect to see a little more detail. And then the very closest trees is where you'll see all the twigs and things like that. So that's what we're going to do with the trees and then we'll do a little bit more with our, our daffodils down here as well. 
So first of all, the distant trees. Now the distant trees are going to be just, quite simply, a smudge of colour. They're really not going to be anything else. I'm going to add some ultramarine into my mix here. And I'm looking to get a bluish colour. I don't really want it. Something like that. In fact, even maybe a little bit more bluer than that. A little bit more water. Uh, right. Okay, let's see what this is like. It might be still a little bit too green. Hmm, doesn't look much different, but we'll, we'll go with this anyway. So the idea is the background trees are no more than a vague suggestion. So I'm going to take the background trees over and above the uh, hedge and then I'm going to soften, notice I'm drying my brush slightly, I just want to soften this top edge so that we don't get a hard edge in these distant trees. So the distant trees I want to stay soft, but one thing they are going to do is they are going to give me the nice edge of my building. So I get that in then I'm essentially painting in what's known as painting a negative space. And that gives me, so straight away, without actually doing anything, I now have something that is starting to resemble the building. Again, I'll just soften that slightly. Don't worry about things like that, because I'm going to be covering those up. And at the other side of, well, I'm going to have a big tree here, so I don't need to worry too much about that. But... Uh, Oh, I don't think I need to worry about that side at all, to be honest, because there's there's a couple of closer trees. I think I've got a couple of cypress-type trees, so they'll fill up that space. So that's really all I need to do with that. Now, just to be on the safe side, now by that, what I mean is, if you soften an edge, you sort of live to fight another day, as it were. When you commit yourself to a hard edge, you are saying, this is something. This is This edge shows there's something there. Without the hard edge, it's just wet paint. Now what I will do, just to give me a little bit more options later on, is I'll just pull out a little bit of colour that is going to be where one of my foreground trees is. Now you don't actually have to do that. And notice I didn't paint around it. And the reason I didn't paint around it is it leaves a very hard edge each side. And remember, hard edges in the early stages, we want to avoid those as far as possible. I'll just give it another quick burst with the dryer okay the clunk is me dropping the dryer on the floor and so then I realize you probably hear strange noises as this goes on so the ne that's the that's the trees that's background trees and some of you are thinking well that doesn't look much like trees and no, it doesn't look much like trees, but it does look a little like trees that you would see in the extreme distance. And remember, what we need to do is make the difference between these distant trees and the closer trees. So the next layer of trees are going to be the trees that are just behind the hedge here. So we're going to see more in terms of the structure of trees, uh, a little bit more variety perhaps in the colour. But still no great detail. Now these are spring trees, so they're going to be um, fairly leafless sort of things. The leaves, and uh, well over here in, in Ireland the, the uh, daffodils are generally out before many leaves are out, so they, they're still fairly leafless. So what I'm going to do is just warm up this mix slightly. Now all I've done there is add some uh, ultramarine and burnt sienna to it, and that will allow me just to, so I just, I'm going to move those two paintings I had up earlier so that I can hopefully perhaps read some of your comments. Apologies if you make a comment and I don't respond to it. Uh, it's only because I'm, I don't notice it because I'm busy doing this. But as I say, um, over there in Tunbridge Wells, Monica will handle all, all the sort of general comments. And my goodness, there's Lynn in New Zealand. Hello, Lynn. And she's... Uh, tuned in, I don't know what, what time it must be over there, I suppose midnight or something like that. Um, okay, 
the next layer of trees. I almost forgotten what I was doing there. So let's get the next layer of trees up. So it's the same sort of thing, but a little bit more in the way of detail. So I'm going to have my, my little brush, my little sword liner brush ready. This is a great, it's sometimes called a dagger brush, but technically a dagger brush has got a, a little bit more of a straight edge to it. So the sword liner has this lovely curved edge and the point is perfect for twigs. Now, if you don't have one of these, you may have a rigger. A rigger will do fine, but the sword liner is definitely more, um, gives you more variety and more, more variation. Now, let's, let's see what we can do here. So again, now the idea is with these middle distance trees is that they will all join together still. So what I'm going to do is a few, and this, this will look a bit, a bit strange. That doesn't look anything like trees, but if I join for start, link them together at the bottom, you start to think, well, now it looks like four sticks with joined together at the bottom. Doesn't look that much better. But if we then start to, this is with the sword liner, start to maybe get a few little cross branches going and a few things in between, then it starts to look, you know, you might think, well, all right, fair enough. It looks a little bit like trees. But remember, our big important trees are these two, not these ones. These are still relatively unimportant. So a few more. In fact, I'll just use the sword liner for this because it's, it's, I think it's important. Some people ask what size of brush you should use. And my answer to that is use a size of brush that you're comfortable using for a particular job. So I use the, the, the big flat brush for the initial wash. And now I am using the sword liner, which feels comfortable. The, the brush I used for this part here felt a little bit too big for this. So there we go. So this sort of broken edge, again, I'm, I'm, I'll avoid, I don't really want to, I'll, I'll not avoid that tree because I want to show you that you don't need to paint round things that will ultimately be essentially darker. So again, lots of little, you can see how quickly the sword liner allows me to do this. So again, lots of little marks. If you hold, when you're using the sword liner, hold it well back up at this end rather than the ferrule end because you have less control and you can sort of jump about with it. It's really rather good. Now I'm going to just take that other brush and I'm, I just need to be careful again going around my building. But now, of course, I have to disguise that because what I've done is a line there and a line there. So now I have to change those two lines and make it look like it's the background trees. So, again, there we go. Right, now let me just tidy up a few extra of these. And when I say tidy up, what I mean is you don't have you know you don't have trees with one big long line like that, so I just need to get some little additional side branches. But notice I'm not being particularly careful. Well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. I'm not being uh, overly careful. In other words, what I'm trying to do is to keep the simplicity of everything. What I really don't want to happen is for something to catch the eye from this section, because this is again essentially just background. We'll dry up some of the edges there. Again, I'll just take that off. And uh, that's that second, second stage of the trees done. So I'll just tidy up a couple of little edges here. And then we'll go on to the building. I think we could do it. What I try to do is work from whatever is in the distance and work forward. So the, I've done the background trees, I've done the, the trees that are uh, just behind the house, and now the next thing would be the house itself. So I want to do it, but again, the painting isn't really about the house. It's not a painting of this called uh, Barnett's house. This isn't a painting of Barnett's house, it's a painting of the park. 
springtime in the park. So the if you, if you liken it to a movie, it's the house is only a bit player. It's just a bit part. So because of that, I don't want to draw too much attention to it. So how do I avoid drawing attention to something? Well, I keep the detail minimal. Very, very little detail. Ah, is that Donny from Melbourne? You're very welcome, Donny. Glad you're enjoying this. So what do we mean by little detail? Well, we need to show enough to be able to see the building. So let's try a little bit of if I do that just under the roof, okay, that separates the roof, but the roof is perhaps, hmm, the roof is a light. And it's too light because the roof is, is a tiled roof, so it's it's uh, much darker than that. But I don't want to get dark here. So what do I do? If I darken it, I'm going to lose that nice contrast. Well, there's a simple little thing that you can do. If I darken my roof there... Rinse my brush, dry it a little bit, and then just keep that coming across, but just let it get lighter. So I retain my light dark interface there, but I still have some, I can now show that the roof is a little bit darker. I think I can afford to get a slight bit darker there. have to tidy up the roof line, but I can again, I can do that. You'll hear me saying I can do things later. And... In watercolour, you know the old saying, never leave off until tomorrow, what you can do today? Well, watercolour is completely the opposite. Always leave off until later, what you could do now. So if you're not sure about whether to do something, uh, don't do it. Leave it until later. Okay, windows. Windows at this distance are going to be no more than just a little line. Now, what I'm going to try to do, even though it's only just a little line, I'm going to try to make each little line slightly different so I'm going to instead of just doing line 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 I'm going to do that's a like if you think of Morse code that's dash dot I suppose that's dash dot as well here we've got dot 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 you know you know what I mean so try to vary all these things uh, down here well we have a little I can't remember whether that part of the building is behind this part that part I think it is so in order to suggest that I'm going to darken there and again using the same method as I did with the roof I'm going to just then soften that so that this is really the same tone and color as this but it now looks it will look as if it's a little bit behind these are large windows here in the foreground, big intricate windows, but again, I'm not going to get too, too uh, involved in detail. We have the little porch, or portico really, I think technically it should be called, because it's got the pillars. Architects would know these things. Gary can tell me that one. And again, I'm going to just soften that tends to be darker at the top, lighter at the bottom, so... Now you can see, hopefully, that house is gradually appearing, essentially, from, from nothing. Now, I've done very little to that, but it's, we've already got something that suggests a house. And it's important not to do too much, because it's very easy when you're painting to think, whoa, I'm, I'm on a roll here, and I know what I'm doing. Um, let's keep going. This is working well. I'll, I'll, I'll keep at it. And before long, you realize, oh dear, I've done too much. So, although I want to do a little bit more to the building, that one bit is that little roof there. So again, I'm going to do the same thing. Although there's quite a bit more to do to the building, what I'm going to do is leave it for the moment. Because if I leave it for the moment, I can still do more to it later on. If I do more to it now and realise later on I've done too much, I can't take it away. So it's easier to add paint than to take it away. So always bear that in mind. So we'll leave the house for the moment and we'll move on now to the... There's a hedge here. So I have to think what I want to do here. First of all, I have to see the hedge against the trees. So the top of the hedge has got to be lighter than the trees. 
But down at the bottom of the hedge, I want it to be dark against my grass. So I want the hedge to start off light at the top and become slightly darker at the bottom. Now, how, how do I do that? Well, it's just a, it's really just a graduated wash, what we would call a graduated or graded wash. So we start off with the light at the top and we gradually add more paint. So if I can get a little bit more green here, so that's again the ultramarine and the burnt sienna. And uh, we can start off, do I want the top of it to be any darker than what the, what we've got at the, at the minute? Let's, let's see, is that going to, I think that's okay. It's not, it doesn't seem too dark. So I'll work that across. It, this may still be wet in places, so I'm going to bring it across there. But before this dries, I want to make it slightly darker. So a little bit more paint. Again, that's the ultramarine and the clinacridone gold. So you can see how much darker that is. But because this is wet, I get that nice soft blend. Now the bottom of this is going to be my... I will paint around the tree in this occasion. The bottom of this is going to be where the grass starts, so it doesn't have to be a perfect straight line. So I'm going to have a little bit of a jiggle, jiggly line as we come across there. And that's fine. Don't need any more. Again, it's not important. It's, it's If we continue our movie analogy, it's a, it's a bit of a bit player. Now, I've included a couple of cypress trees here for two reasons. First of all, there actually are a couple of cypress trees, but it's also it's quite fun to do cypress trees and, and really quite quite easy. So again, a little bit well, say, I shouldn't say it's easy because of course I could make an awful mess of it. Well, let's see. So cypress tree, you get your brush, you hold it this way, you hold it against the paper, and you go whoosh, just like that. Now a little bit wobbly, but that's not too bad. Again, we've got another tree here, so I'm going to just I'll paint around that because I want some nice light on these foreground trees. So on this occasion, because I want such light in here, I will paint around them. don't normally like doing that, but I will. Now, this darker green, just so that it doesn't appear out of nowhere, I'm going to just drop a couple of little spots of that darker green in further back. And then here we can have another... Another couple of cypress trees. So again, on the paper, straight up. Oh, it's a big one. Right. And then, oh, there we go. So, cypress tree. Now, with the cypress tree, just as we're talking about cypress trees, uh, what you can do, the, the light in this subject is coming from the right-hand side. So what you could do is I've just got a little bit of darker green there, and I'm just touching the darker green to the wet paint that's already there and it will do the job itself. Notice I'm not doing anything, just adding that in and that helps to give that little bit of variety on those trees. Again there, just dropping that in. Now if you try that and you see that it doesn't make any difference or even worse that you get cauliflowers happening, uh, that's because you're adding paint that is weaker than what is already there. So I'm very careful to make sure this is stronger than what's already there. If you add stronger paint, that will happen. If you add weaker paint, you will get cauliflowers, runbacks, whatever you choose to call them. Again, don't like wasting paint, so soon I have some in my brush here. Variety, you see, is one of the important things in watercolour. Variety really brings things together. Okay, I'll dry off the bottom edge of my little hedge here. Now, it's important to do this. If you don't, I've just been talking about runbacks and cauliflowers. If you don't dry up this edge, and I'm just using the tip of a damp brush. If you don't dry up this edge, what happens is this part, this part dries, this part stays wet, and what happens is this tries to push up, and then you get... Our old friend, the cauliflower, coming back. So, there we go. Now, let's move closer again. So, we've now got up to the, the hedge and trees that are just behind our main tree. So, now we have our, our grass 
and our daffodils. Now, I'm saying daffodils, of course, all we've got is a yellow smudge in the paper. So how do we turn those into daffodils? Well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, again, with watercolour, sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. But the important thing is, it's better to go down being confident and trying it rather than going down being all frightened and tentative. So be bold. Don't worry about what. Don't worry if a drip, if you get drops in the paper, if you get a, a run down the paper. It doesn't matter. The important thing about watercolour is its transparency and spontaneity. And the only way you're going to get that if you are spontaneous in painting it. Okay, where was I? Back to my grass. Okay, in the distance, I just want to get a little bit of variation back here. So what I'm going to do is just take my brush. I've just same green that's there. The thing about mixing greens rather than using a mix a made up green is that every time you mix it, it'll be slightly. So you can see all these greens are all very slightly subtly different, and that will always happen when you mix your greens. And basically, any blue and any yellow. Although some do make horrendous mixes. Tallow blue green shade is not a good green to use with um, with yellow because it gives a very garish green. I'm talking here, I'm not even thinking what I'm doing. So uh, I've now got something that's, I've got sort of tram lines coming across there, which I don't want, but that's okay. I've been painting wet, so I can get rid of those. There we go. In fact, while I've got my little damp brush here, I just soften some of that. Again, remember, if you soften an edge, you make it less obvious, and you take away the impact. So, if you're not, that's why I say, if you're not sure about whether an edge needs to be hard or soft, start with it soft. You can always harden a soft edge. It's a lot more difficult to soften a hard edge. Okay, back a little bit more. Again, notice I'm avoiding that little interface, so so that I keep that nice um, contrast. Okay, well, well, we'll go on with that a little bit more. How am I doing for time? Oh, we're fine. Okay, a little bit again. I've made up a slightly darker green, so I'll drop that in to some of the areas that I've already done. That looks a bit obvious to me, so I'll soften that. Notice when it softens, it just sits back. It's no longer... A major issue. Now we're coming up to where we would expect to see perhaps a little bit more definition in the grass. Now I'm going to resist the temptation to do tufts of grass or at least too many tufts of grass and again we're still really too far away at this point. Now I've got my yellow here so what I think I'll do is I'll darken the green there and that can be the edge around my first drift of daffodils, if I can call it that. Again, let us let me do something completely wrong. If I do something like that, that sticks out like a sore thumb completely. It doesn't matter. So long as that's wet, it's gone. So remember your brush, your damp brush is like an eraser. You can, you can use it with your paint the same way as you would use an eraser with your pencil. Okay, back here. Now I'm really just try I'm trying things. And the idea about trying things is that the marks that I make, if I don't mind what they look like, or on the, in the unusual event that I actually like what they look like, I leave them. But if I make a mark I don't like, I soften it. So it means I can try things. And if there's marks I don't like, they're all okay, so I don't really have an issue with any of them. But if there were any I didn't like, I didn't like that one, gone. If I didn't like that edge, gone. Okay. Now, the thing about daffodils and yellows, yellow will be overpowered by anything. So make sure you have much more yellow for the daffodils than you will need. Because you're going to paint over a lot of the daffodils with green. So you can paint green over yellow, you can paint yellow over green. So I'm going to get a little bit of yellow here and I'm going to do the same thing really as I did with the grass here, except I'm going to do it with the yellow. And again, notice 
I'm not painting anything that remotely resembles a daffodil because it's still too far away. All we would be aware of would be the, the really just the colour. So again, little marks. As we get closer, I'm going to just use the side of my brush to make that a little bit rougher. Now this still looks nothing really like, looks nothing like daffodils or flowers or anything. It looks a bit like yellow grass. But it's important to build things up. Don't try to get the final result immediately. It's not going to happen. You need to build up to things. Now I've got some green again because now I've got all this yellow. Clearly you would see the the uh, the stalks and the, the leaves of the daffodils. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to work around the gaps really where I haven't painted the yellow. So I'm going to work around those. Some will run together. That's okay. That's why you need much more yellow than you you need to start off with much more yellow than you'll end up with. And by adding the greens in, then we start to get, well, our brains know that daffodils or any flower consist of the colour of the flower plus green. So, so long as we can get green and a colour and the setting is roughly what you would expect, well then, essentially, our brains will think, okay, right, I can, I can be persuaded that that's daffodils in this case or whatever it might happen to be. Okay, softening, a little bit of softening. Remember, when in doubt, soften. You can go back and you can harden an edge. You can't really go back and soften an edge. I know you can. Or, or everybody starts shouting at the screen. Yes, I know you can, but it'll never be as clean and it will never be as simple. So, soften, soften, soften. Again in there, it's a little bit awkward, so I'm just going to soften that too. Done. That's that bit done. Okay, let's now review. We've got from back to front. Well, still a little bit to do yet, but not too much now. If we go right back again, I don't need to do anything to the distant trees. I don't need to do anything to the middle ground trees. Do I need to do anything to the, to the building? Um, possibly not, but we'll, we'll, I, I want to do something to the building, so I'm going to, going to do something, just a little bit. Not very much. So I'm mixing a grey from, uh, well, a blue-grey from Ultramarine and Burnt Sienna, which is a really, really useful mix. Ultramarine and Burnt Sienna. If I could only have one mix, it would be Ultramarine and Burnt Sienna. It's, it's a great thing. Okay, so I'm going to run up my roof again. So that gives me the edge of my roof a little bit clearer. Just make that slightly darker. Right, windows, so if you think of what I, I did very little to these windows, but if you think of what I did, I'm just going to do about half of that amount with the slightly darker mix. Again, it's really not much more than a couple of blobs. Again in here. And I want to soften that. That was probably unnecessary to be perfectly honest in there but it's done now anyway. The building itself is a sort of creamy colour and I just want to warm it up at the minute. It's it's not white paper if you remember it's uh, the first wash but I want to warm that up slightly so I'm going to use some let's see get some paint out of the palette there. I'm going to use some burnt sienna. Very weak burnt sienna and it just will give me a little glow and I'm going to use this to show up the portico, if indeed that's what it's called. So if I do that, you can see the, the white portico, but of course I've now got this hard edge, so what do I do? You're all shouting it together, hopefully. You soften the edge. Well, if I soften the edge, now I've got that little bit of warmth, but I've also got the portico showing up. And I can do the same thing, maybe over here. So again, it's just for variety. Interest. Make your paintings interesting. Ignore re reality is not important. What is interesting is what you're putting on your paper. And so.
so important to make your painting interesting. Over here, I forgot to do this the first time round, I think there's a window in there. If not, we'll put one in because it looks a bit odd without one. So again, a little mark there. Up at the tr up at the the uh, chimney, got a little bit of light there. I'm not quite sure where the shadow would be cast, but we'll get a little bit of. Probably wouldn't be there actually, but anyway, uh, <laughs> we're, we've got a little bit of that. I, I always forget about chimney pots, so I suppose we better put a couple of chimney pots in. There we go. So that for me is is the building pretty much finished. Okay, let's move forward. Do I need to do any more to this hedge? No looks like a hedge. Do I need to do any more to the cypress trees? No, they look like cypress trees. This is where disaster can strike if you start being too fussy and if you think, oh that doesn't, well, okay, we're being precise. No, it doesn't look like a cypress tree. Cypress trees have got branches and, and uh, whatever you call the leaves in a cypress tree. So it doesn't, but it passes as it, it suggests a cypress tree in the distance and that's what we're all about. But what I'm itching to do now is get on to these things here, the two foreground trees. We have light on the right hand side of the trunk and we have shadow on the other side of the trunk. So what can we do to do that? Well there's several ways of doing it and I'll, what I'll do is I'll show you a couple of different ways. I'll, I'll do one way with this and then a slightly different way with that. The well, one way is just get some nice warmth, a little bit of warmth and I'm going to run this warmth down the side and what I then get is some dark and run that down the other side and let the two meet and you can see what happens. The, there's a soft blend between the dark and the light side and that means that that suggests the roundness of the trunk. If there was a hard edge there between the light and dark that would suggest that the trunk was square and I don't know maybe in Australia or New Zealand there might be square trees but we certainly don't have any here so now while that's still wet I want to be thinking about branches now notice I haven't drawn any branches because it's much easier to paint branches than to draw them so I'm going to just again make sure that I've got a Slightly stronger mix than what's already there. You see that ran into it, but it just softens and disappears. That's okay. Uh, that could probably do with being slightly stronger. There we go. And again, with the little sword liner, this is where it really excels. Because it just, you can just sort of flick it over the the surface and it just sort of well I was going to say it paints the trees itself that, that's not really right it doesn't but, but it makes it a lot easier so if you haven't got one of these little things I would definitely suggest one very good now that's because this is still wet I'm still getting lots of nice softness here now I will not bring the branches down too, too far because in a public park, they always cut the lower branches in case people, I suppose, bump into them. If this was a wild forest, you would get lots of shoots coming up at the bottom. And got that. So we've got we've got branches that could be coming out the side or could be coming out the back of the tree. We also need to get a couple of branches coming out the front. So can't really do that while it's as wet as that, but we can do that a little bit later on. Now it's important to cover up some of your background because when you cover up your background, you create uh, an over what's called an overlapping shape. And when you get overlaps in your painting, that immediately is telling you this is in front and this is behind. So overlaps are very important. Again, this is so easy to get, really, to overdo things because it's so much fun. Let's let's leave it at that. You know, the, there are lots of branches on a tree. It's really up to yourself how much or how little you wish to put in. Now, on this one, I started off with the the light and then added the dark 
wash at the side. This way I'm going to this tree I'm going to do this one slightly slightly different. I'm going to have again ultramarine burnt sienna. I don't want to tempt Providence when we tried this yesterday. The not the painting but the the whole Facebook Live thing. It was an absolute disaster. <laughs> I'm sure Monica's laughing as she thinks about it. And um it's so far I get to temp problems so far it's going very well. The technology anyway. Let's go dark. Dark, dark, dark. Dark, dark, dark. The whole tree. Dark. This is why you have to be careful about space that you leave because you have to make sure that you fill it in. Oh, just before I leave my little tree over there, I need to just blend it in with the with the grind a little bit there we go so we've got this tree and I've already said we want light on the right hand side so well what how can I get light on the right hand side I've just done that well just lift it out and the thing about because you're lifting it out it will automatically be soft rinse your brush frequently because obviously you are as you lift out you're putting paint into your brush So you can see how by just pre-painting the trunk with the dark, you can then just lift out the light. And again, you get that soft edged blend between the light and dark. Now just looking over at this, we've got a couple of little awkward edges. So I'm just going to touch those up a little bit. Now again, very important, while that's still wet, same thing, tree branches. It's always a good idea, if you can, to link the two trees together. Now, even just doing that, essentially we're linking the trees together, even though it's that tiny, tiny amount. Because connections in watercolour are so, so important. When you connect something, you're linking it to other things and you're linking it to the rest of the painting. So it's vitally important. Vary the colour. That's all a bit brownish. Let's get a bit of blue in there. So mix. Don't be afraid to mix your paint on the paper as opposed to on the palette. Variety, variety. Now, I'm being fairly quick with, with these. I would take a little bit, not much, but I would take a little bit more care over the branches. Now, it's important to make sure the thickness of the trunk uh, is, is in keeping with the width of the branches. So, for example, they're a little bit short. So, I'm going to just bring this over a little bit. Over here, obviously, it doesn't matter because it's coming away from the now. Because of the, the paint that I'm adding into the left, we're getting a little line there, so I don't want that edge. So I'm taking my brush, rinsing it in the water, dabbing it on my sponge, and just going down that, and that just softens that a little bit. The sponge, incidentally, is one of those sponges that are made for cleaning a car. They're extremely highly absorbent. So that little sponge will hold seemingly more than its own size in water, which presumably can't be the case, but it holds an awful lot of water. Very good for this. I, I, eBay, eBay. Look for a high absorbent car sponge or something and you'll you'll find it, but it's it's very good, very good. Okay, uh, let's see, can we get, oh, we'll get another, another one in here. So notice again, I'm deliberately taking that across the building because that relegates the building to a less important role. Okay, now we'll let that dry. Just soften that edge. Hopefully that will blend a little bit more. Soften that edge a little bit. And back down to the, to the foreground and our, our daffodils. So what do we need to do here? Well, 
Let's get some more daffodils in. So I'm going to use again the cadmium yellow. I'm going to add a little bit of cadmium red to that or other warm red. Doesn't matter. It could be pearl red, Windsor red, all sorts of things. It's just to give me more, more variety. Uh, and well, down here, let's see. I'm <laughs> trying to remember what a daffodil looks like. Oh, well, something like that. Let's see. This is why I, I paint in an impressionist way, because I don't have to be too precise about things. I know it has the trumpet in the middle, so we haven't really got any trumpets there yet, so let's, let's uh, save the trumpets for a bit there. So a couple of little petally marks, shall we say. This is where my lack of horticultural knowledge serves me greatly, because I don't have to be worrying about whether I'm doing this right or not because it's it's all to do with an impression a suggestion that's really all now I'd like to get some of the pure yellow because I do like the pure yellow there we go and again just so again variety just instead of using one color use two or use three the advantage with cadmium yellow as well is that it because it's opaque or slightly opaque it will cover up to a certain extent, some of the darks behind, so you, you can use it for that sort of benefit. Do, 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 right, dab, dab, dab. Now I want to get, I definitely have daffodils in my garden that have an orange type of trumpet, and the orange trumpet is really good because it means that we can get, Graham, that is nothing like a daffodil, but sure. Let's get that a bit redder. Where was that left space for a trumpet? There? Oh, I don't know. Okay, when and I just do a couple more dabs and dashes. Right, okay. I don't think the daffodils are working particularly well. So, two things you can do. If something isn't going according to plan, you have only two choices. So, in this case, daffodils are not quite looking the way I planned them to look. So I have two choices. This isn't working, so I, continue, I can continue doing what I'm doing, which is the answer that a lot of people would have to this thing. So what will happen? Well, I'll just have more daffodils that don't look right. Or what I could do, the second thing you can do is just stop. Don't do any more daffodils like that. Minimize the, minimize the problem. So, you know, it's, it's okay, but it's not going exactly according to plan. So stop, leave it, do something else. Let's get back to the tree. And on the tree, I want to... I need to be quick here because I want to finish at about 5 to 11. Yes, I can manage to answer any questions anyone has. Again, apologies, folks. I, I sort of haven't got time at the minute to look at the comments because um, I'm sort of concentrating on this. It's nearly said panicking, but I'll not, I'll, we, we, don't, we don't panic. Us watercolour painters don't panic. Certainly not. Okay. Bark on the tree. You can get a, a reasonable sense of bark. If I take my brush, dark wash, quite dry, and just do a little. Now, not every tree has bark like this, of course. Silver birches would be the common one. But then the trunk wouldn't be just as dark. But you can get a little hint of bark that way. A lot of trees, the bark is more vertical. That's okay. You do it vertical. And by doing it over the light parts, again, you, you just get a little bit more. Well, you get texture in the tree, which is really what we're after. Okay. A little bit of green for the leaves down the front here. Okay. Now, now I am using a couple of little sort of tufty marks just to try to indicate what we have here. Now, I'm, for some reason, I'm drawn to this corner here. So if I want to sort of, I quite like the idea of the eye maybe going, you know, going in a nice sort of S shape. So I want to sort of direct the eye from here over over to this tree. So what I'm going to do is I'll have most of the green here 
and indeed the darker greens here. But then what I will do is sort of gradually just sort of lead the eye over there. And then the idea, hopefully, is go for a little wander through the painting. I don't know whether that really happens, but that's what you read in books. <laughs> it is true. It is true. If you have, your compositions should all be sort of letter shapes, you know, that, that you could call this a U-shaped composition. That you could also say I'm involving s shape or z shape as well so all those shapes we were trying to connect things together finally finally just a little bit of shadow and i'll use uh, ultramarine with a touch of cadmium red and a touch of burnt sienna and that'll give me a sort of purpley gray and again broken ground so we'll not get too much in the way of a solid shadow but we'll get that little sort of broken broken shadow and obviously you would get that in the ground as well here and there you might get a shadow from another tree coming across and i think that is that and if we take the edges off hopefully it it always looks better. That's why we always put the tape on because they, when we take the tape off, we've got a painting as opposed to just splashes of colour. There we go. So there we go, folks. Springtime in the park, and please have a go at that. If you want to know all the finer detail, don't forget that it is in my book that I've just ruined with splashes of colour here. Uh, Watercolour Landscapes, published by Search Press, of course, and uh, available at all good bookshops. Now, let's see, let's see. I want to have a look at some of these. These uh... Right, let's see. If anyone's any questions, please, Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Bravo. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please do, do ask. I'm sort of looking through them here. We'll stay online for another couple of minutes. And... Um, We'll see if uh, if there are any questions that need answering quickly. Uh, my mouse has decided to go walk about here. There we go. Uh, well, thank you first of all for all the the, the kind comments, folks. That's uh, very nice of you. Again, thank you all for taking the time to stop by and watch. This will be on the Search Press website uh, after the, after today, so you can see it. And I think ultimately it will also be on, on YouTube. Uh, let's see. I don't think there's any questions. My goodness, does that mean I explained everything properly? Not sure. Let's see. Anyway, nice to see so many people too from all over the world. Really lovely. And there's a lot of people there from my classes, so hello to them. And uh, I'm going back through the comments here. Can't see any real questions as such. If you have any questions, please do contact me. Monica is giving you the, the details of where you can get hold of me, my website and things like that, Facebook and stuff. So please do ask, ask questions. And um, I think that's probably our time up, folks. So once again, thank you so very much for joining me today. And um, actually, that wasn't as painful as I expected it to be. This that's the first live broadcast I've done, so uh, it, it was actually okay. Very weird talking to myself, but still. Um, so maybe we'll do that some other time as well. So thanks again, folks, and have a great day. Hope you're all keeping well through the lockdown and keep painting, because if you're painting, you can't concentrate on the troubles of life. You can only concentrate on your painting. Bye.